day of subsea events. We appreciate all of you being here today. My name is Jeff Seal. I'm the managing partner for Telecom Review Magazine. I already know several of you in the audience today look forward to meeting the rest of you throughout the day today. The goal of AP Telecom's state of subsea event series is to promote a forum for all industry players in the subsea business to improve the communication within the submarine cable industry for new models and new ideas. At each state of subsea meeting, industry thought leaders from around the world come together to exchange ideas about the industry. Today's event is attended by folks that are in person here at the Portland Gallery in Washington, D.C., but also by many more worldwide via live streaming using subtel forum, live streaming capabilities. How's that sound? <laughs> A little better, hopefully. Uh, the, the entire event is, is streamed around the world. Uh, Subtel Forum is here today, and we've got folks in quite a few countries worldwide that are listening. Welcome to all of you that are out there today. Uh, we'll have panel discussions today. We'll have presentations today. And when we have the panel discussions, if you do have some questions for the panelists, uh, please feel free to send them in via Twitter using AP Telecom Net, or excuse me, at AP Telecom Net. And uh, we have folks that will receive those, and we'll be able to post them here for the panelists as we go through the presentations there. I want to thank the organizers and sponsors of this event. This includes AP Telecom, Telecom Review Magazine, Subtel Forum, North Six Agency, and PTC, Pacific Telecom Council. After the event today, if you so wish, we're here at the Corcoran Gallery. Uh, AP Telecom has arranged for a special tour of the gallery, if you'd like. And uh, at the end of the event, please stick around, and it's available for you. The uh, proceedings from today, the video from today, all collateral from today will be available after the event at www.stateofsubsea.com. So please make yourself, uh, or feel free to make yourself available to those things. Um, we will have a lucky draw also later today. You need to be present to win toward the end of the presentation. In addition, I'd like to tell you that our thoughts and prayers go out to the family of one of our submarine cable colleagues, Happy Zhang from China Telecom. She was one of the folks that's on the missing Malaysia air flight. Today you're going to hear keynotes and panels addressing the key challenges and opportunities of the telecom industry. There'll be insights from industry leaders from around the world, so we hope you enjoy today's session. And now I'd, I'd like to uh, introduce our first keynote speaker. Uh, our speaker is His Excellency Cambodia Ambassador Hang. Cambodia's ambassador is a diplomat with more than 30 years' experience working in foreign affairs. The ambassador was born in Kampong Cham Province on November 8, 1951. He graduated from agricultural school in Phnom Penh in 1970. His diplomatic career started in June 1979 when he joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and, Inter and International Cooperation. Ambassador, I'd like to invite you to come forth for your presentation. Good morning, everyone. It is a great honor and privilege for me to address, you know, the uh, auspicious audience or expert audience today. And uh, I'm delighted to take this opportunity to talk about the development of Cambodia from a commun communication perspective and from an economic perspective. As you may or may not be aware, Cambodia is a fast developing country. The World Bank is forecasting Cambodia growth to more than 7% this year, despite the fluctuation brought about by recent world economic events. This is a tremendous success story for any country in this day age, and especially for Cambodia in light of its recent political history. While much of this growth can be attributed to the manufacturing, agricultural, and tourism sector, 
It is evident that the success would not be possible without a strong communication sector and without communication companies such as Easycom taking the lead. Cambodia currently has a population of approximately 15 million and today about one-fifth of its people are using the internet. The growth per year over the past few years have been about 200 percent. Much of it is driven by the professionalism and dedication of companies such as Easycom. Easycom CEO Paul Blanchhagen is considered as a pioneer in ICT in Cambodia. He was there during the first dial-up internet connection some 70 years ago, and today he is at the forefront of the industry. Easycom itself was launched in 2007 and since then has grown to become Cambodia's leading ICT companies. Its acquisition of fiber optic company Telcotech in 2010 gave Easycom coverage of 99% of the country usage. Today, Easycom is not just instrumental in advancing the communication sector at home in Cambodia, but it also putting Cambodia on the communication map internationally as well. It was Easycom's vision and determination that brought about the Malaysia, Cambodia, Thailand submarine cable, MCT, of course, with the support of the Cambodian Ministry of Post and Telecommunication and the Royal Government of Cambodia, led by Prime Minister Hun Sen. The Malaysia-Cambodia-Thailand submarine cable will represent yet another milestone for Cambodia's communications sector. It will increase the speed and efficiency of communications and will also bring the cost of everyday service, such as Internet, down. It will integrate Cambodia even further into ASEAN, and by doing so, will hence link Cambodia to the United States via the Asian-American Gateway. To summarize, the MCT will have a huge impact on Cambodia. It will prepare the country for a great leap forward at a time <coughs> when more and more nations and blue ship companies are looking to come and do business with Cambodia. As a result, for Cambodia, the communication development could not have come at a better time. It will help the country take part in ASEAN and compete with its neighbors. It will take Cambodian communication into the 21st century and will have almost every sector of the country's economy. So without any further ado, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Easycom for its contribution to the rebuilding of Cambodia, and I would like to salute all the companies which are playing a part in Cambodia's communication sector. After all, there will be little growth without communications. In today's digital society, communications and internet are essential for everything we do, including business. In Cambodia, we look forward to the next ICT milestone. We look forward to the inauguration of the MCT submarine cable, and we look forward to the connecting with you and the rest of the world. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ambassador. We appreciate those words. Our next presentation is going to review the Australia-Singapore cable. Steve Liddell is going to make a presentation about the cable itself. Now, Steve has, been, has a career of over 25 years in this sector. He's built and run several telecom internet businesses in the U.S., and Asia, and Europe. He's been responsible for the formation and or construction of several successful submarine cables including Gemini, Japan-US, and North Asian Fiberloop. 
His background includes building and running fiber, co-location, 4G wireless, and video content distribution businesses. Steve, if you would, please. Thank you, Jeff, Mr. Ambassador, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I think if I press this button, we should have, well, maybe not. All right, you're going to get it in reverse order here. There we go. All right, that's the one. So um, back in my um, level three and MCI WorldCom days, I lived through a a capacity glut that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, the, the mantra in those days was build it and they will come. And actually in many cases they didn't come. And there were a, a lot of underutilized cables for, for a number of years. And actually a lot of investors lost a, a great deal of money. Now today's environment I think is very, very different. Uh, we are entering what Cisco calls the, the Zettabyte era. And for those of you who don't know what a zettabyte is, because I must admit I struggle from time to time, there is a little scale on the, the side there. So the drivers for uh, IP capacity growth are huge these days. And then you get into these extraordinary statistics. For example, it would take one person five million years to watch the amount of video traffic crossing the global IP backbone in just one month. The second main driver is the, the cloud. We've read lots about the cloud. It's a you know, high growth business, particularly from the, uh, the data center business. I'm sure Hunter is going to mention some of this uh, later on. It's higher growth actually in Asia Pacific. Um, and you know, clearly enterprise applications uh, will require the same geographic diversity that you'd expect from a storage solution. If you're, having app, if you're using applications over the cloud, they need to be robust. They need to have the resilience. They need to have the redundancy, the same kind of redundancy that you would expect in storage um, solutions as well. And then the third impact is just the number of devices that are IP enabled. Now, nearly half of all IP traffic uh, will originate from non-PC devices over the next five, uh, four or five years. So, for example, televisions, tablets, mobile phones, machine to machine, all of those are huge drivers. And in fact, by that time, more than half of the IP, global IP traffic is going to be driven from non PC devices. Another fact which um, I find fascinating is that the number of devices that are connected to an IP network in 2017 will be nearly three times the global population. Just, it's quite staggering what we're going to see in terms of those growth aspects. So let's talk about Australia for a moment. That's the right chart. That's good. So for Australia, these, um, these trends are compounded by a couple of other factors. There is the NBN. For those of you who are not familiar, NBN is a large government uh, program. It's a $30 billion uh, investment into uh, infrastructure. The idea behind it was to provide a level playing field and to some degree to disrupt the vertically integrated structures of uh, Telstra and uh, Optus in, in Singapore Telecom. The idea was to provide a wholesale model, service operators operating uh, over a common uh, cost in infrastructure, and also to disrupt this, this vertical integration that we've seen in the Australian market. For example, I don't know whether you, many of you realize that Telstra has been just such a huge hindrance, I know this is going out live, huge hindrance to the development of um, uh, the Australian market. For example, they are completely vertically integrated. They've got the national backbone. They are the, the dominant fixed line provider. They have the, uh, one of the largest HTTP uh, networks and cable TV operators, Foxtel. They've got uh, the leading mobile operator, and uh, obviously they are a carrier, a uh, mobile carrier. And they're also the leading ISP, uh, or a leading ISP with, uh, with Big Pond. So you've got a vertically integrated structure. And as a result of those structural impediments, it's been difficult for alternative operators, alternative suppliers to uh, become active and disrupt that uh, market structure in Australia. So ASC is one project uh, which will help that. It will interconnect with all of the 121 
NBN points around Australia and um, also you know, provide a new opportunity for many companies looking to enter into Australia. So you know, aside from the domestic demand growing through NBN in Australia, there's a huge opportunity for Australia to become a, a base of operation. You know, we've had a, a number of discussions with some of the large content uh, providers, some of the OTT providers uh, looking to expand their activities in Australia for good reasons. It's a geopolitically stable part of the world. It is um, a place which is culturally more akin to many of the uh, European and uh, UK uh, companies in particular. But the impediment has been the availability of uh, low-cost infrastructure within this vertically integrated structure. The other interesting fact here is the geographic imbalance between capacity leaving the shores of Australia. So, for example, I mean, 80% of the population, I, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar, lives on the, the East Coast. So it's no surprise that all of the traditional submarine cables have been uh, led from the, the, the East Coast. In fact, there's seven uh, active systems uh, leaving the East Coast and only one uh, leaving the, the West Coast. And the numbers speak for themselves. If you add up all of the design capacity, not all of it's lit, but all of the design capacity for those seven uh, East Coast cables, it, it's 16 terabits. Whereas there's one legacy cable system, which is well into its life, that's CMUE 3, a consortium cable with restrictions on ownership, and the total capacity of that system is only 200 uh, gigs. So there's this huge imbalance between the East and the, the West in terms of capacity. Now, Western Australia may have very few people by, compa uh, by comparison to the East, but it's been a, a huge area, massive investment over the past 10 years. The oil, gas, the, the mineral uh, sector, particularly on the Northwest uh, Shelf, means that many of the, uh, the large oil and gas companies, mineral extraction companies, need the capacity to get into, for example, Singapore, and in fact, back to the, uh, the US. And to, to a large degree, ASC is a disruptor of that, uh, that market structure. Because it has the, if you're a large OTPP provider or a large content provider and you're looking to invest into infrastructure, you're looking to co-locate, you're looking to put servers um, in Australia, what you care about in terms of the connectivity to the rest of the world is three things. You care about price, you care about the amount of capacity, and you care about reliability. You've got to have the, the diverse routes uh, in order to provide the, uh, the reliability of your solution. I think this next slide um, demonstrates that uh, fairly well. So um, below, the, the one um, other factor which I think is very important is if you look at that green line all the way from Sydney, there is a much lower latency route. It reduces the latency by about uh, 30% compared to if you're going the other way around Australia into uh, the, the Asian market. So low latency, clearly very important for uh, many companies, many applications. It's also an alternative route to the US. If you think about the traditional routes, looking at that uh, dotted yellow line, it goes through some fairly difficult um, waters. The Luzon Strait, very prone to earthquakes. It goes through some uh, difficult uh, territorial waters as well. So what we're hearing is a, a lot of interest from companies wanting diversity to get to, uh, to the US. And the other huge factor here, um, which we might talk about later in one of the panels, is the, the growth in Indonesia. Uh, it's a long time since I've been to Indonesia, and uh, I'm sure many of you, who, well, many of you may have been there, but massive growth in Indonesia. And you know, the mobile um, activities there in particular are driving huge uh, IP demands. They're just getting into their first 4G uh, markets. So what we're going to see is a lot more IP demand from Indonesia. It's extraordinary growth uh, in that country. And at the moment, all of that growth is going through Singapore. So there needs to be a diverse route for you know, the Indonesian operators going through to uh, Australia. So the big question is, you know, if it's so great, you know, why has nobody built a cable from Western Australia um, so far? And I think there are th really three reasons for that. Um, firstly, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the key is getting across Australia. I mean, the, the Nullarbor, which is the big empty bit across Australia between Perth and Sydney, has very little. It's a desert. It's a long build. It's a very expensive build. 
and next-gen networks, who I'll talk a little bit about in a moment, is our sister company owned by the share, same shareholders, has the only independent wholesale offering across that route. So what this does is it actually creates the ability to sell a service pop to pop. So instead of dropping somebody in Perth and saying, all right, up to you, buddy, you can get from Perth to, uh, to Sydney, you've got to get the whole way across Australia. You've got to get to the main uh, population centers and to connect with uh, many of the, uh, the US routes as well. So up until now, that's been impossible because the vertical the vertically integrated structure of the incumbents, Telstra and uh, Singapore Telecom Optus, oops, excuse me, has made that actually very difficult. So without your own fiber, alternative fiber, across Australia, it is very, very difficult for any competing system to, uh, to provide the service. Secondly, the, the second difficulty has been, it goes through, um, Indonesia goes through the Sunda Strait, which is the bit between Sumatra and, um, and Java. So uh, it requires the cooperation and uh, commitment of the Indonesian governments. Getting the permits has traditionally been a very difficult uh, thing to do. We actually have our permits. We uh, partnered with uh, a very good local uh, firm I'll tell you about in a moment. But uh, getting those permits has been traditionally hard. And then the third factor, and that is finance. The, uh, this particular route escaped the irrational exuberance I mentioned earlier. There just simply wasn't the, the finance around for what uh, was seen very much as a niche route. And financial investors are much more careful these days, much more cautious. They want to see you know, a good sign of pre-commitment from, uh, from customers. And so those combined with the earlier impediments have made this route really one of the last few you know, key routes and uh, a very, very important route for Australia, but also for activities, geopolitical and political activities in the, uh, the region. Now, I'll spare you the, uh, the, the long words on the, uh, the commercial here, but just a quick word for those of you who don't know NextGen Networks. NextGen Networks is owned by the same shareholders as the ASC uh, cable system, and this is the, uh, the long haul network. Um, it is a nationwide fiber network across Australia. The only alternative to Telstra and Singapore Telecom uh, Optus. And because of this, it has the only integrated wholesale offering uh, to get across Australia. Without this, it would cost the customer more to get from Perth to Sydney than it would to get from Perth to Singapore. So that's a key factor. It's a stable company. It's been around for 10 years in, um, in operation and uh, has its own co-location centers throughout the, uh, uh, the, the country. And that's actually very attractive for a number of the, the content providers, and the OTT providers with whom we're talking, because it gives them uh, what we call Australia in a box. We can provide a, a complete wholesale solution without competing with these companies across Australia. So this is really the disruptive market entry of which the ASC cable is a, a component. Quick word about the ownership. Um, it was um, NextGen and ASC were wholly owned by Leighton Holdings. If you don't know Leighton, they were the they are the largest Australian construction company, about 57,000 employees listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. 70% of the company was sold to the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund in 2013. And for those of you who don't know, OTPP is 130 billion dollar fund. Uh, I had to ask them to repeat that when I first started working with, uh, with OTP in these projects, but they are big. Uh, and you know, clearly that means that NextGen and ASC has some very, very strong financial uh, backers, which is important. Quick word about the project itself. Um, it is um, going to land in Perth. We have our own landing station already constructed in Shetton Park in Perth, our own fibre network connecting directly to the beach manhole. Uh, we are landing in Tanamera. It's the last landing slot, in fact, on the eastern seaboard of uh, Singapore. Uh, one of the three fibre pairs, three fibre pair system, one of the three fibre pairs will branch out into um, Indonesia to provide connectivity there. And XL Axiata is our landing party in Indonesia on open access principles so customers can choose their own backhaul provider in uh, Indonesia as needed. X Excel is actually a tremendous company to work with. We've been really, really happy working with them. They're the second largest mobile operator 
uh, owned by the, uh, the Malaysians. And they actually have 27 of their own landing stations around the region because that's how a domestic work, a network works in uh, yeah, an island uh, country, essentially. Alcatel Lucent has been under contract for the last couple of years, binding contract. Uh, we've completed phase one, which is all of the marine survey work, all of the permitting is, has been done. Uh, so we're well ahead in uh, that activity. And as I mentioned earlier, I'll say it one more time, the key here is the continuous 100 gig connectivity all the way through to the next gen network uh, from Perth right the way through to, uh, to Sydney and to the, the major capital cities. And that's something that any other competing system simply just cannot do. So where we are is um, all the companies are established and licensed as uh, operators in Singapore and in Australia. We've partnered with Excel, um, Axiart. We have a binding agreement uh, with Excel for the uh, Indonesian landing. We're fully permitted in Australia, Singapore as an FBO, and most importantly, in Indonesia, where we received the marine permits in November of last year and the, uh, the landing permits in uh, January of uh, this year. So where we are right now is we're signing up our pre-commit customers to uh, give our investors the confidence that uh, this is a, uh, a safe investment. We're well on the way. Um, we should be able to close that out within the next month or two. And so we expect to commence the phase two construction activities in uh, Q2 with an RFS realistically in the middle part of uh, 2015. So I try to keep the commercial section short here, but uh, thank you very much for listening. And I hope I'll meet a number of you uh, later on this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Interesting presentation. Our next presentation is going to address the emerging markets of Africa and S Southeast Asia. And our presenter is Eric Handa. Eric is a co-founder and CEO of AP Telecom. AP Telecom is a facilities-based telecom and fiber consulting company specializing in emerging markets. Now, Eric's been in this business for quite some years, uh, roughly 17 years of ICT experience, gained at some of the world's leading telecom companies. Eric, if you would, please. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for once again coming. Uh, I'd just like to say hi uh, and a good afternoon or a good evening for the folks viewing it around the world, wherever you may be. Uh, I promised uh, the folks in, uh, in Angola that uh, I would say hello to them. So hello, Arthur, Fabio, Eugenia, and Arietta, and Darwin. Uh, as promised, I promised I would say hi to you. Uh, this morning, I wanted to just really focus in a little bit on the emerging markets in question that AP Telecom's working in specifically. Uh, it's not a sales pitch. It's really a very high-level uh, macro overview from a Socratic point of view, where we sit, where we see those markets, and where those markets are going, both politically as well as socially and technologically. Within Africa, we see a population of about a billion people. Our anchor client there, Angola Cables, uh, is engaging in a very uh, large orientated project to supplement what they have already, which is an existing $100 million investment on the WAC system. Uh, AP Telecom has been aggressively monetizing that, selling that, for lack of a better word, for them over the last 18 months. It's been a great experience. We're seeing strong demand into the African subcontinent, particularly on the west coast of Africa. Our second client, that uh, Steve had alluded to in his presentation with regards to Indonesia is a population of 250 million. Indonesia is a growth market. Indonesia is a hot country, represents strong, strong opportunity. Everyone talks about, particularly in Washington, D.C., here in the U.S. or in New York or in London, the major metro markets, the term BRIC, Brazil, Russia, India, China. We believe that BRIC is a little bit saturated. It's almost 10 years too late. 
We believe in the MAVEN markets, Mexico, Angola, Vietnam, Indonesia, Nigeria, Cambodia. There's a new coming markets of emerging markets that are out there that are going to really dominate the next three to five years, and we see the growth coming from these markets. They need knowledge transfer, they need technology transfer, and they're going to see strong growth. The last uh, country that uh, we're going to talk about, um, not necessarily in that order, is echoing the, uh, the words of uh, His Excellency, the Prime Minister, specifically, uh, of Cambodia, uh, that, excuse me, the ambassador of Cambodia that uh, talked about this morning the ICC development that's happening in his country. Uh, I've had the chance to go to Phnom Penh uh, three times over the last six months, and uh, as soon as you step into the airport, you can tell things are changing. There's growth, there's a lot of modern foreign direct investment, there's a change for the future, and I think it's an exciting proposition and an exciting thing to, to cover. So let's, um, let's begin the presentation. We talk about the global backbone, and it's not just about the, the, the global backbone. If you build a submarine cable and you come into a landing station, into a beachhead that effectively is stranded, you do very little to improve the connectivity for the citizens of that country, the enterprises of that country, or the government of that country. And this slide here is more visual. There may be some folks that are watching here in person in the audience. There may be some folks that are dialing in live real time in Africa or in Asia right now that feel this, that understand uh, the pain that goes into a new submarine cable that lands in a country, but there isn't open access. It's still dictated by very few that own the bottleneck, that own the last mile. So one of the uh, important things, in particular, that Steve mentioned in his presentation with regards to ASC is that open access element. The ASC cable has an open access element. It's first ever in a market like Indonesia. And that, folks, is a game changer. That enables connectivity to really free flow for all providers. So it's not setting up a duopoly or an oligopoly. It's an open market. It's a fair market that folks are able to get connectivity from the landing station to various pops within the central business district or wherever they want to go, nationwide NLD coverage, metro access. Let's talk a little bit about the emerging markets. Uh, we see about 5.7 billion people uh, on the planet, which represents uh, about 80% of the world's population. Uh, we're very fortunate here. Our, our venue, the Cochrane Gallery, uh, is a beautiful place. We're within walking uh, distance of the White House uh, and the mall here in Washington. Uh, but there are many folks around the world that don't have access to technology. And in order to bridge that gap, the digital divide, to bridge that digital divide gap, you need to put the building blocks in place, the foundation. That foundation is very, very important in emerging markets. And again, I use the term brick, not in a uh, perception or a derogatory manner, but the brick markets are important markets, and they definitely have population metrics associated with it, but there are many, many other markets, such as Africa, Cambodia, Indonesia. There's other emerging markets out there, not just the BRIC countries. And I would ask everyone to start thinking along those lines of new opportunities for new, new businesses that are coming. We see, as the, uh, the ambassador said with regards to Cambodia, we see a, a very dynamic uh, uh, technological-based society forming in Cambodia. Uh, and we also see migration of manufacturing for the textile industry leaving markets like China and coming to Cambodia because they see high quality, they see strong production, and they see the ability to export their products around the world within ASEAN as well as the rest of, of, of Asia. Okay, let's just do a deep dive uh, into Cambodia. The, uh, the nation uh, of Cambodia, obviously uh, with Easycom, our client uh, within Phnom Penh and nationwide, has effectively the first fiber buried network within Cambodia, and that's the key. That's the key driver. In many emerging markets, uh, whether you're dealing in India, you're dealing in China, whether you're dealing in Indonesia, uh, you have a lot of aerial-based solutions, and um, those tend to have uh, not the strongest uh, reliability. And that reliability is something that's extremely important. But within Cambodia, the investment was made by Easycom going back to 2007, 2008 timeframe to build a fiber buried network that's very unique in a market like Cambodia. That is a key driver for them that will enable them to continue to, to drive foreign investment as well as companies coming in to seek low cost connectivity, to set up shop. 
The cable that the ambassador mentioned, the MCT cable, just to give you a visual for the folks that are here and the folks that are viewing around the world, where, where this goes and how it works. So uh, EasyCom, through its vehicle of Telco Tech, made an investment as a consortium member in the AAG system, the America Asia Gateway system. That system needs to be connected to. Currently, from Cambodia to AAG, there is no connection. That's the purpose of the MCT cable. The AAG cable originating in Malaysia is the America Asia Gateway, AAG commonly known as, within the submarine cable space. And that would leave Southeast Asia from Malaysia. That would route via Hong Kong to Guam, Hawaii, and then on, onwards to Konus to the US mainland, into SLO and then one Wilshire. The MCT cable uh, is a unique uh, uh, build. It's something that we see strong demand for, and it's not going to contribute to any sort of glut of capacity. There is a, uh, a need uh, for the system. It will provide a feeder system for onward connectivity for Cambodia, as well as Thailand, and as well as Malaysia. Uh, and this system with MCT is really going to, again, be a game changer within Cambodia. We're going to see internet rates drop, and we're going to see a population that's very uh, hungry and thirsty for low-cost connectivity uh, to be able to have that connectivity and bridge that digital divide. So the, the, the next um, geographical area that we want to just kind of focus on after Cambodia is Indonesia. Indonesia in a box, uh, we'd like to say with tin, is, is an interesting proposition. The Trans-Indonesia Network uh, uh, was set up about three years ago. It's about a $200 million build that was completed by, uh, by Alcatel um, at the time. The network is a very uh, uh, much of an archipelago. And the next slide that uh, we'll, we'll drill into is one that uh, anyone that's been to Indonesia can appreciate. Uh, given the archipelago and how the islands form to make up the large part of Indonesia, it's a very challenging place to, to build out infrastructure, whether that infrastructure is in the telecommunications sector, whether it's in manufacturing, uh, particularly in telecom. A lot of the islands uh, are, are linked by submarine cable systems. The ASC partner, uh, XL Axiata, as Steve alluded to and mentioned in his presentation, has 27 landing stations already, and that's to run a mobile network. So to give you a sense of the challenge, uh, if you're uh, coming from Australia, or you're hailing from uh, Europe, or you're coming from the United States, you pretty much have flat land, so to speak. Uh, you don't have to worry about water, but that's not really the case in Indonesia. So what Tim was able to do was build a next-gen network. This next-gen network is deployed, uh, it's state-of-the-art. They're linking the two major islands that you guys will see here, which is Sumatra and Java. The network is an NLD network. It's a nation-long distance network. It's buried fiber. The uh, capacity can support 100 by 100 gig technology. We're seeing international carriers starting to take capacity on this network. The TIN network specifically is seen as a next-gen, diverse, low-cost solution for anyone that needs connectivity within Metro Jakarta or nationwide Sumatra and Java. This network enables you to come off a diverse position if you're on XL Axiata, uh, Indosat, if you're on PT Telecom, anyone of that, that, that nature. So the upside in Indonesia is there. Uh, there was a couple slides that uh, we had discussed uh, last year in Singapore at a conference. Uh, just to put things into perspective, uh, the Facebook market outside of the United States, the second largest market is in Indonesia. Uh, you'll find many folks are, are on Facebook in Indonesia. The connectivity angle is there. And the, the amazing thing is that, uh, hailing from the US, when I am in Jakarta, uh, you often see a, a, a model very different. We're on a, a credit card basis. Uh, you know, we're, our, our accounts are deducted on a monthly basis. But there, it's actually a, a prepaid model. Folks are actually topping up on a day-to-day -day basis. And they're still using Facebook. And the, the growth is tremendous. So with that growth, we see uh, a very small percentage of the 250 million people within the archipelago of Indonesia, within Java and Sumatra, connected. And that growth is probably going to continue at least another 30 45%, which will take us to some strong numbers, probably a couple hundred million within the next three to five years. So the metrics are there, the population is there, the investment, we think the return on investment is there. OK. So moving on to the last one, uh, in Africa. Angola cables. Uh, Angola is an, uh, a nation on the west coast of, of Africa. And I have a video that I'm going to show after a couple slides 
that runs about two and a half, three minutes to give you an idea of what, what's going on in Angola. Uh, Angola Cables was formed in 2009. It's effectively the international wholesale group of the nation of Angola. Uh, Unitel, Movicel, Startel, MS Telecom, and Angola Telecom comprise and constitute uh, Angola Cables. They're the uh, five major shareholders. The mission of uh, Angola Cables is really to provide development uh, for the ICT uh, sector within Angola and becoming a, a hub in Africa. The uh, Wax investment that I mentioned in the next slide we'll cover uh, was made a few years ago. Uh, Angola made a significant tier one investment, about $100 million on that cable. So it's not like Angola doesn't know what they're uh, in with regards to submarine cables. They've already made significant investments, and they will be making uh, additional significant investments with the new cable and the first cable ever to be linking West Africa to South America. Currently, there are no cables on the South Atlantic. Uh, we talk about the glut on the North Atlantic between New York and London on the nylon route. Uh, well, there's actually nothing on the South Atlantic. And we see as the Southern Hemisphere, south to south, builds happening and population metrics going up. You've got a billion people in, in, in Africa. You've got uh, just over 220 million in Brazil. Maybe it makes sense that a cable, something is built on the Southern, the southern Atlantic uh, leg. And that's exactly what Angolo Cables is doing. So let's talk a little bit about that in, in the next couple slides. I mentioned WAX. Uh, folks may be familiar with the WAX system. It's a uh, multi-terabit system from South Africa up to the UK via various city uh, pairs in between. It, uh, it lands in, in Ghana, Cameroon, Angola, Nigeria, uh, terminates in, uh, uh, in Portugal as well as into Highbridge into the UK. The, um, the system itself is a unique uh, cable in that end-to-end uh, -end connectivity can be uh, sold and purchased in places like uh, Ezra Fontaine in South Africa uh, up to the UK to say Global Switch in London. Uh, we're, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we're seeing really strong demand on the enterprise side as well as the wholesale side. And this again is a driver to reduce the cost of connectivity as Africa continues to uh, take shape and grow and uh, see really strong growth rates of, you know, seven and a half, eight, eight and a half percent. Connectivity is a, a key piece of that ingredient to propel and continue that growth. So the wax cables are playing an important role. This system here is in the water. It's built today. This is not something that's uh, hypothetical or on a PowerPoint. This is deployed. It's in the water, uh, actively being sold. The SAX cable uh, is the South Atlantic crossing, and uh, it's, as I mentioned, originating from the west coast of Africa, from uh, the nation of Angola to uh, Brazil. Uh, there's onward connectivity to the United States from Brazil to, to Florida. Uh, that cable uh, is also uh, being planned out. And again, it offers a, a realm of possibilities, not only for Africa and Brazil, but it offers tremendous possibilities for example, with the situation in Egypt, it offers an Egypt bypass potentially for carriers in the GCC, for carriers sitting in India that have had to effectively reroute traffic via Singapore to Japan and then to the West Coast the long way around. So there's a tremendous opportunity for not only West Africa and Africa, the continent of a billion people, and Brazil, there's tremendous opportunity for onward customers and onward connectivity, particularly within the Middle East, particularly within the subcontinent of India. And we believe that that is a major driver that will enable the success of the SACS cable and then the cable from Brazil to Florida. So let me leave you with a video that um, I think will give you a little bit more uh, insight and uh, feel for what's going on in Brazil. Uh, there is some music in the video. Uh, I don't think anyone's going to start uh, dancing, but uh, if you want to, you feel free to come on the stage. Strategically located on the west coast of Africa, Angola, the seventh largest country in Africa, 27th in the world. More than 1,200,000 square kilometers, 1,600 kilometers of coastline, nearly 18 and a half million inhabitants with 44% under 15 years of age. 
with a GDP of over $115 billion and an estimated growth in GDP for 2012 of 6.8%. With the fastest growing economy in Africa, with Moody's giving a positive rating and the IMF predicting that Angola will be one of three countries that will grow most this year. Deeply influenced by Western culture, both from the contact it had with almost 500 years of Portuguese colonization and by the emotional relationship it has with Brazil, Angola became an independent nation in 1975. It has vast natural resources such as phosphates, iron, copper, gold and diamonds and is already the largest producer of oil in Africa. For some years, Angola lived through a turbulent period. However, today it is a politically and socially stable state and is seen by many as a regional power. It is a country that lives today in peace as a nation with a deep commitment to national reconstruction. In the last 10 years, Angola has invested heavily in infrastructure, services, housing and health and has rehabilitated more than 5,000 kilometers of roads, rebuilt 2,700 kilometers of railroads and more than 148 train stations, reconstructed airports and seaports, developed the entire telecommunication sector created special economic zones in order to promote the establishment of new business, built high schools and universities across the whole country, built and equipped hospitals, maternity clinics and health centers across the country, developed housing for young people. Some time ago, Angola defined telecommunications as a strategic area of development. With a privileged geographical location, the country has positioned itself as the telecommunications hub of Africa. With the wax cable going into operation through the Sangano station in Angola, the country seeks to meet the growing needs of the African continent, as well as the connections between Africa, Latin America and Asia. Here is a country worth investing in. Here is Angola, a country of the future. I'd like to thank you for your time and your attention in listening this morning uh, for those folks here as well as around the world. Uh, the information is available once again on uh, www.statusofsea.com, and thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Great presentation. And now we're going to have our first panel session for today. The first panel session is going to talk about the future of content distribution and infrastructure. The moderator for this panel is going to be Sean Bergen. Now, Sean is one of the co-founders of AP Telecom. He has a sales and marketing background, has been in the international wholesale telecom business for oh, more than 15 years, has significant experience at large companies such as Telstra, BT, and Hutchison. Sean, could I ask you to come on up, please? Now, the, the, the other panelists are going to be Alex Vaxmonsky, Director of Global Networks at Equinix. Now, he's a director at Equinix. He's uniquely positioned to provide insight into data centers and ecosystems of service providers, web content, and applications. Alex? <laughs> Our next panelist is Hunter Newby, who's the CEO of Allied Fiber. Hunter has amassed deep subject matter expertise and contacts in the telecom networking industry spanning 15 years. Hunter, thank you. Our next panelist is Tim Strong, VP of Research at Telegeography. Now, Tim has areas of expertise that include international voice traffic, terrestrial and submarine cable systems, and interna international bandwidth markets.
And our other, our other panelist is going to be Steve Liddell, who you heard about a little bit earlier. Steve. <laughs> Sean, I'll let you begin. Thank you very much, Jeff. When I started in the uh, telecoms industry, we really had heard of these content delivery organisations, but they weren't actually running networks per se. Most of these people that had content tended to be customers of tier one carriers, as opposed to being customers in the wholesale sense outright. So there's been this shift over the last decade to seeing these as almost like a new vertical in the wholesale sector. And that, that's had an impact on our industry. And, and I think we've got the right people up on the stage to, to talk about that. So firstly, I'd like to hand it over to Hunter. I mean, how are CDNs affecting the way your business operates? And how, how is it, what changes has it influenced in your own organization? Uh, first, I'd say thank you, Sean, and thanks to everybody at AP Telecom for being here. Um, clearly, content uh, is creating um, a very interesting scenario relative to who owns the network and what do the end users really want to see uh, and where the, the, the pinch points are for the gatekeepers. Um, and the gatekeepers are the traditional telecoms and network operators and incumbents that have uh, historically provided connectivity for end users in a consumer sense out to everything else. Um, and the disintermediation of uh, telephone service now towards a, an OSI model based uh, network architecture where content sits at the highest layer of uh, the application, which is independent of the network infrastructure, has created um, an interesting scenario. And we've seen some of these things play out recently, for example, with uh, Comcast and Netflix, which is pretty timely and I think spot on with this. Uh, the impact that it's been having on, on our business at Allied Fiber is really that we have a whole new uh, dimension of customers uh, to buy uh, dark fiber and, and lease associated uh, neutral co-location and interconnection services from us. And it is, in fact, those content providers. Uh, because they seek to own and control uh, their own underlying infrastructure so that they can mitigate the risk of having a middleman between them and their ultimate customer who is the end user. Now, of course, in a consumer sense, this is challenging uh, and problematic due to the fact that a lot of the content's being consumed on mobile devices and obviously the end users can't build their own mobile networks and the content providers are also not going to step into that space. Um, but to the extent possible where they can, they, the content providers, can get their own fiber in a superstructure core, which is what Allied Fiber builds, um, directly into cable landing stations to connect to submarine systems and other metropolitan and regional transport, uh, dark fiber and or transport providers, they can push the content further and further out towards the edge uh, and make it easier and better more cost effective and higher quality for the end users to connect to it. So that is a big trend that we're seeing. It's not just a trend, it's a reality. It's happening now uh, and it's having a real impact on, on what we're doing. How, how, does, how does that feed into, the, you talked about taking it to the edge and by the edge you're talking about the end user, the eyeballs. Yes. In that sense, the, the, the quality of experience, I mean a, a content provider literally has very little control over the quality of experience. So for example, yes. Uh, whether it be a Netflix or, or, or whoever, the quality is going to be dependent upon the quality of the network. So if we talk about emerging markets, and we even talk about America, with the amount of people that are actually viewing content on mobile devices, I mean, the mobile backhaul network becomes a very critical element, I imagine. Tremendously. I think the United States is an emerging market. Um, I think that, that there's been too much focus historically on what's been considered the NFL city strategy and everyone always talks about the major cities and connectivity between the major cities. Uh, that's important for us. That's important for us also from the perspective, if you look at it a little bit further back, between the cable landing stations themselves, which is a focus that I've had for many years. But it's not just about the, the CLSs and, and the major cities. It's about every basically every 3,000 feet between the major cities. And that's the increment at which we have, for the most part in our system, uh, handholds for direct fiber splicing for laterals. And I look at that as a, a mobile tower, fiber to the tower, uh, distribution system. And it's to address exactly what you just said. Uh, the quality of the backhaul is what directly correlates to the quality of the mobile network itself and the experience. LTE 
uh, and the challenges of deploying LT in the United States or in any country, particularly Australia, Steve pointed out in his presentation, it's geography. It's the size of the country and the cost to build per mile or per kilometer to get infrastructure out into the, the hard to reach places uh, is the underlying infrastructure that provides the backhaul for mobile networks. And if the infrastructure isn't there, then the antennas can't be deployed. The spectrum is there, the air is there, but the infrastructure in terms of the tower, uh, the antenna, it doesn't work properly if there isn't fiber. So how do you build a model to bring a, a fiber to the tower strategy out across a nation the size of the United States? or Australia. And these are real challenges. It applies to everyone and anyone. But that has a direct impact on quality. As soon as you get out of major metropolitan areas, uh, the, the spectrum availability, again, the usefulness of it is all determined by backhaul infrastructure. And LTE really only works effectively if there's fiber. Because the amount of capacity per device times the number of people at any given moment creates what I call musical chairs. And a lot of people don't have a seat. And it doesn't work. So content providers are going to um, feel the pinch there. And everyone's all going to point at each other and say, well, it's, it's your job to pay for the infrastructure. I just want to ride over it. And obviously, the infrastructure providers think differently. They think it's the responsibility of the end user and the content provider to pay them both for the infrastructure. So we're watching this play out. And it's actually created a situation here in the US where infrastructure development has become a grind. Because investing in infrastructure from a private equity perspective is not the type of bet that they want to make because it's a very long payback period. And they see opportunities in other things, particularly in M&A, which I'll talk about in my presentation, of existing fiber assets, which is more tangible, has less risk associated with it, and brings returns sooner than it would to build whole new infrastructure. Alex, I suppose that's a good segue into having a chat with what you folks are up to. So what, what role do data centres and, and co-location facilities, in your mind, um, play, play in the CDNs of the future? I mean, what role do you see? Hi, my name is Alex Vaxmonski. I'm the Director of Global Networks with Equinix, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, we very much see ourselves at the forefront of the digital crossroads going forward. Um, today, we operate in five continents, uh, spanning 15 countries, uh, across 32 metros. We operate about 100 or so data centers uh, within these metros. Um, much of what we've been doing in the past year has been um, sort of chasing after the traffic, if you will. Uh, if you understand the way traffic is flowing around the globe today, you'll know that the overwhelming amount of traffic that connects these continents flows through the sea and not through the air. So a lot of the constructions and builds that we've been doing have been in these emerging markets, places like Jakarta, Rio, uh, Dubai, Osaka, Melbourne, Miami. Um, we very much uh, pay close attention to what's happening out at the sea. And, um, you know, much uh, the way the company was structured 15 years ago to sort of solve uh, some of the problems plaguing the internet community at the time, that was discontiguous networks that really didn't have the capability to scale. Uh, we kind of filled that gap at the time. And very much uh, going forward, we see um, a lot of services, applications, and things migrating to the cloud. Obviously, um, being uh, the largest retail provider of, of Colo, um, we naturally feel like we're in a good position to, um, to impact and support uh, not only the things that have developed in the last year and a half, things like big data, um, online video, things like that, but also the yet to be determined game changers. Just so as a follow on question from that, how, how, how are dealing with the CDN players compared to dealing with the traditional customers? Is it a different set of demands? Is it a different set of metrics? Uh, what, what sort of challenges do they represent for you? 
every every customer presents a challenge. Um, today, we've uh, we've only got about 4,500 customers around the world. We've got about 975 networks, about 900 cloud and IT service providers. Roughly 70 percent of the world's traffic flows through our data centers today, and that's not slowing down. Um, in terms of the profile of customers that we support, all of them present unique challenges. Um, and so it, it's our job to sort of glue uh, not only the, the, the networks, but the CDNs, the mobile operators, the application providers, the infrastructure guys. That's our job. Um, that's what we do. We've been doing it uh, at a layer two for, for quite some time. And uh, like I said, we, we feel like we're, we're in a good position going forward. Okay. Tim, uh, what, what's, your, what's your take on the content delivery networks in, in the context of the impact that they've had on the submarine cable industry specifically? Sure, well, if we could sort of expand the definition of what we consider a content delivery network to, to companies that manage their own content uh, and deliver that. so. Google's and Microsoft's and, and Facebook's, then I would say that we're in the middle of uh, a really important transition in the subsea industry. The um, uh, Google's participation in Unity was, was uh, kind of a, a first of its kind a few years ago. And we think that there are going to be plenty more Unity type models in, in the future. Um, one thing we like to do at, at Telegeography, or not necessarily like to do, but are paid to do it, is to count stuff. We count stuff all the time. One of the things we count is how, how much capacity is purchased and used and by whom. Uh, we do this every year and, and sometimes more frequently. And we've seen something extraordinary in, in the last few years. Uh, for uh, really since internet took over voice in 98, 99 as being the majority of, of international bandwidth usage, um, ISPs accounted for about 80%, 85% of all uh, bandwidth usage and that's been really consistent but then something odd started happening a couple of years ago uh, we saw the growth of bandwidth usage from ISPs start to fall off pretty dramatically across the Atlantic um, ISP bandwidth uh, increased only about 20 percent and it had been 35 40 percent in the in the years uh, previous it, it's kind of alarming um, it, it was to us we did a lot of double checking to make sure that you know we understood what was going on and that it was correct. Um, a couple things have been happening. One is a uh, long time ago peer-to-peer -peer traffic was uh, uh, pretty important for, for driving a lot of bandwidth and that's largely gone away and, and it's been displaced by companies pushing, uh, controlling their own content and pushing it out to, to end users which is a more efficient model. And that means there's less international bandwidth being developed uh, for, from that. Um, so there's been efficiencies gained that uh, ISPs aren't uh, controlling their own or, or, or taking as much traffic between countries now. Instead, it's the actual content providers that are, are doing a lot of this. Uh, certainly, we've seen Google being very big in the international bandwidth industry. They have huge internal streams. Microsoft increasingly, uh, Facebook certainly. Facebook has participated in a cable in Southeast Asia uh, already, SJC. Uh, we may see others as well. Amazon has been fairly quiet. They may be purchasing more capacity. So what does this mean for the subsea industry? Um, I haven't necessarily seen this yet, although I, think, I suspect some of you have. When you're taking away uh, buying power from a dispersed group of companies, such as ISPs, and concentrating it in a handful of big buyers, that's generally bad news for the sellers. And it's good news for the buyers because uh, there's more market power in the, in the, in the pockets of, of these bandwidth buyers. The, the big content guys are, are pretty smart. Um, not only are they big and can kind of throw their weight around in terms of, of procuring bulk discounts, but increasingly they've been hiring um, people who know the subsea industry. Uh, optical engineers, for example. So not only do I think we're going to see increasingly these people participating in new submarine cable builds, but even if they don't participate, they will often know uh, what it, it costs to build a cable and to participate in, in a new build. So they know the cost structure of their sellers. 
that also gives them a, a lot of buying power. So they can demand cost plus or, or very near that. So I think it's going to be a bit of a challenge for some, for some traditional sellers that are accustomed to dealing with old carriers that don't really know the bandwidth business, old PTTs, or savvier ISPs, but a dispersed group of them that don't have as much buying power to a hand, or it's not just going to be content providers, but uh, concentrated into a, a smaller group of, of companies that do know the market well. So that's going to be fun to watch. I'd just, just like to pick up on something you mentioned. Uh, with, with the advent of content delivery networks, caching, and trying to get content closer to the, to the eyeballs and, and to the users, is there an argument that says less bandwidth would get consumed? Because once the content's distributed regionally, closer to the edge, it's not being repetitively distributed. It's there already. Is that going to have an impact on slowing down the uptake of capacity? I don't think there's any doubt that it does to a certain extent. But it's all kind of relative. We're accustomed to seeing 35 to 40 percent growth. We're talking maybe 25 to 30 percent growth now. There's still a lot of, of bandwidth uh, being created every minute. And content providers, due to the way they, they structure their networks, um, or some of them structure their networks, also create new forms of, of bandwidth demand. If they have uh, uh, databases of videos or of Facebook posts or whatever that need to be mirrored across, across the world, we didn't really see that kind of machine-to-machine uh, -machine traffic before. We're, we're seeing that as well. So, some bandwidth is um, it, it's more efficient, but some new forms of, of bandwidth demand drivers are, are emerging as well. Overall, it is slowing somewhat uh, bandwidth growth we're seeing. Steve, uh, you've been involved with CDNs for more than a few years, <laughs> nearly a decade, I'd, I'd believe. But um, wh what's your take on, on, on how CDNs have changed or evolved and how it's impacting on our, our industry now? Well, I, I've been listening to the uh, discussions here with uh, a lot of interest, and I think there's been some great points mentioned by the other panelists here. And uh, yeah, I'm coming from this at this from a slightly different perspective. I've actually run two CDNs, one as a CEO and one as a, as a president, and it really is a, a, a changing market. Now, there's a couple of facts. I think if you look at that uh, same Cisco research I mentioned earlier on, I think it's on the internet, um, you know, something like 50% of um, the, the growth in traffic demand across international networks is going to be driven by CDNs. And I think Tim raises a very good point. What is a CDN? A traditional CDN in the, uh, the old school would be an Akamai, a Limelight, uh, uh, more recently a Level 3, my, uh, my own uh, alma mater. And um, you know, I ran a couple, uh, C a CDN company in New York and then one in uh, Florida. Now, what's interesting is the CDN business is actually a software business. It's a carrier business and it's a software business. It's an arms race in the CDN world because it's all about um, getting the, the most efficient delivery to end users um, through a combination of um, the, the, uh, the network configuration where you peer with uh, the different eyeball networks where you home your content to uh, Alex's point about uh, um, Equinix who've obviously done very well out of this, uh, this market but fundamentally the hard part of CDN is software. It's all about load balancing. It's about you know, trying to make sure that you get that content as close to the end user to provide the best end user experience that's imaginable. Now the traditional CDN uh, businesses over the past 10 years, if you go back to the mirror images or the, uh, the Akamai's in, the, in this world, they've done a really good job because what they did is they basically said to the eyeball networks, look guys, we'll make this a lot cheaper for you. We'll actually embed our content in your network and you, you know, we won't pay you for it. We'll house our servers there, we'll put our you know, equipment there. And the eyeball network thought, well, this is a pretty good deal. You know, we're not actually you know, having to pay for all this content to, uh, to come over. So that was one model which has been very successful for Akamai. They will buy um, IP transit, a little bit of international uh, connectivity uh, when they need it. But fundamentally, they're the market leader. And so they have been able to invest far more into the features 
that make a CDN offering attractive. The efficiency of the caching, uh, the speed at which uh, content is delivered to the end user, the degree of integration with the, the content uh, management systems, um, all of the digital rights management that go along with that. I mean, a lot of complexity goes into the vertical stack for a, a CDN. Now to the, uh, the, the earlier point that Tim made, that, that's changing. I mean, the biggest uh, CDNs essentially now are the actual content providers. I mean, uh, Google has you know, built their own CDN on a huge, huge scale. And uh, so what we're seeing, I think, is a transition, transition of the demand for these facilities away from the traditional CDNs into the hands of the actual content providers, particularly the, uh, the, the larger ones. So I think the, the two drivers, the two big drivers for a CDN, if you look at the, uh, the income statement of a CDN, and I've spent a lot of time doing it because they were both distressed companies, <laughs> the, uh, the income statement uh, is comprised of two big cost items. One of them is IP transit, and the other is uh, co-location, because we all know how much Equinix charge for their uh, co-location facilities. <laughs> uh, High-quality facilities, I know. But the, the IP transit... Um, is by far the biggest line item in the cost structure. How much does it cost to get that content out to an eyeball? Now, all, all was great, all was fine in the days where peering was, uh, was, was carried out. All these guys got together at Nanog and they agreed their free peering and they opened up ports here and there. And then suddenly the, um, the big um, eyeball networks, and uh, there are some obviously some live cases going on right now with uh, Comcast and Level 3. Suddenly they turned around and said, Well, wait a minute, guys. You know, you're peering with us. You're selling a CDN service to these uh, video providers. You're collecting that revenue. You're not paying us. We're delivering the infrastructure in the, the last mile. So suddenly this has become the number one issue, I think, in the net neutrality discussions, which hopefully we won't get drawn into in, uh, in this, uh, this discussion right now. Then why did you just bring it up? Um, <laughs> you can if you like. <laughs> I'd love to hear your you views. <laughs> the doors open. That's right. So the, you know, the market for CDNs is changing. There's no doubt that you have to get that content closer to the end users for the end user experience. And this is nowhere more important than in video. I mentioned video in my uh, presentation earlier on. And this has been the game changer because the imbalance in these uh, peering relationships has just changed the economics considerably. Now, just a couple of uh, minor facts uh, for you. Um, I did actually a lot of work with Netflix over the, the past couple of years. And uh, I could be wrong. I may not be completely up to date, but I believe at least a year ago, 30 5% of the internet traffic demand at peak is from one company. That's Netflix. 35% from one company. And it shows you the impact of that consumer demand and the need for that content to be housed closer to the end user. Their library, by the way, is around about two petabytes. Two petabytes, that library. And so what they have to do is to figure out a way of getting that library much closer to the end users. And the reason it's such a big, um, big library is because they've got all the movies, all the movie rights. So they've got to um, transcode those for every single mobile and PC uh, device that, uh, that is out there and carry multiple different copies at multiple different bit rates to allow adaptive bit rate uh, um, uh, encoding. So this is one of the most important factors. It's about software, it's about cost, and it's about how those impacts, I think, to a large degree, are being taken out of the hands of the CDNs themselves, the traditional CDNs, and moving much more towards the actual content owners themselves. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Jeff, do we have any... Uh questions coming in from uh, our online audience out there. Actually we do, I just noticed this. We, we had one come in from Facebook and this comes in from Tony at IBM. For a purchaser making choices about content distribution, what are the most important questions to ask a potential provider? Well, I'd like to hand that question <laughs> over to my friend here from Equinix. Cost is always a consideration. Reliability, scalability, those are the three main things that typically uh, customers look at, whether you're talking about a cloud environment. Um, those are the driving factors that 
ultimately motivate them to make a decision? Yes, and I think, I think in summary it ties in nicely to what Steve was talking about, and that is the fact that uh, I think one of the reasons content providers have moved further into the value chain with regard to capacity is it is enables them to actually control the quality of experience. To a large extent, they could have had the, the best content, the best apps in the world, but if it's delivered over inferior networks, their products won't fly. And I think, I think, think that's one of the key messages and one of the, one of the prime motivators for these uh, CDN players getting involved in, in this space. Good. Any, had, no had another one, did you? We had another one come in here. And this came in via Twitter from uh, EasyNet folks. And it is, with broadband becoming ubiquitous, is content distribution going to become customized? Or will things such as limits and security impede this from occurring? OK. Um, let's, let's rephrase that. Uh, let, let's look at an example. Movies just come out, Noah. It's been banned in about 10 countries. What sort of a, I suppose, nightmare does this create for those distributing content on a global basis? Uh, one quick comment from me, um, and DRM is, is one of the biggest issues facing the, uh, the uh, over-the-top providers. Digital rights management, uh, making sure that regional distribution of these, um, these movies, new, uh, new content, is, is a big issue. So uh, the ubiquity of uh, broadband coverage is clearly a factor, but also you know, the degree to which that is uh, transcoded and available quickly um, through those individual markets. Is anyone else? Just, I think there's a difference in, in content. Movies, as in Hollywood movies or Bollywood movies or whatever, they're pretty easy to distribute. Once they're made, they're done, and you can send it out. So House of Cars, Kevin Spacey's not con constantly calling in asking to tweak this or that, that part of his performance. He, it's, once it's created, it's created, and Netflix can, uh, as a result, my understanding is it doesn't have a very large core network. It's huge at the edge. That's, that's the 35 to 40 percent of, of the internet. It's, it's local. It's not international. They're not going to be a big subsea cable provider. But where it becomes challenging is user-generated content. The lots of little, little bitty Aunt Lorraine updates her Facebook status, or this guy in Romania posts a video of someone crashing on a bicycle. Well, that has to uh, be distributed all around the world and mirrored in all sorts of different locations. And there are millions of those uh, updates that happen every day, probably every hour. That's where it gets challenging, and that's why you need a big network. Well, can, can I make one more quick comment as well? I, I think okay. Then we'll wrap it up. Good, good point, and that is um, you know, the, the limitation and bandwidth choking. Um, through traditional peering relationships, and we've begun to see some of those traditional peering relationships crumble, and the need for you know paid peering to actually stop that content being blocked. And this really is kind of one of the, I think, one of the biggest issues as far as net neutrality is concerned. Okay. Well, thank you, panelists. It's been a very interesting discussion, and and I'd like to hand back over to Jeff. That, thank you very much, everyone on the panel. Thank you. Coming up is our uh, refreshment break. Uh, the Corcoran Gallery has some, some great galleries out here. There are refreshments across the hall. We're going to take 10 minutes for a, a little break here and come back. So that would be at uh, 1025. See you in a few minutes. Hi, I'm Steve Heap, the CTO of Hot Telecom, and I'm here with John Hibbard. Uh, John and I are going to talk about uh, PTC, its evolution, and how it's helping telecoms in the region and the industry. So John, perhaps tell me a little about your history in the organization. Well, I've been a member of PTC now for um, some 22 years, wow. and uh, <laughs> it's been a, a fantastic time in the sense that uh, I've built so many relationships through PTC that it's really made my career, particularly as I evolved into a consultant, and uh, you couldn't do without the, the, uh, the groupings, the gatherings, and, and the collection of people who are available within the, the PTC Brotherhood. What sort of topics are covered at PTC? What would attendees at, uh, expect to see? There's a range of topics that come at the, at, at the conference, but, and, and they therefore ripple through. My particular area is particular submarine cables these days, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a great fraternity here. It's a great opportunity to uh, to get together with them. But then, those meetings and gatherings occur, and, uh, op and new initiatives occur during the year, and so the 
the whole PTC relationship is filters through in that, and it's not just the conference. That's, yes. That is very important, but it is just one plank in the whole of the, the PTC e value chain. Okay, everybody, welcome back. We uh, now have the rest of the world uh, watching us, and uh, thank you to everyone else that's watching from around the world. Welcome back. Uh, we are in the middle of uh, finishing our, our first break. Everybody enjoyed the refreshments, I hope. Our next presentation is going to be in regards to U.S. domestic fiber infrastructure. Now, Hunter Newby, who's the CEO of Allied Fiber, is the one that's going to give this presentation. He's well qualified. You heard about his resume a little bit earlier today. Hunter, please come on up. Hello again, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, so my name is Hunter Newby. I'm the founder and CEO of Allied Fiber. Again, I'd like to thank uh, AP Telecom and all the sponsors for this opportunity. Spe specifically, I'd like to thank uh, Eric uh, for being here, uh, for my being here today. And a, a shout out to a couple other Eric's that I know that aren't here, Eric Gutschall and Eric Contag. Uh, I didn't promise them I'd say hello, but I just did to uh, embarrass them that they're not here. <laughs> because they should be. Got that, Gutty? So I'm going to give a little overview of the, uh, the state of dark fiber backhaul from CLSs in the United States as it relates specifically to subsea. Subsea is something that's near and dear to my heart and, and my sort of uh, career and history in this business um, from my days back at Telex at 60 Hudson Street focusing on transatlantic systems and now with Allied Fiber building superstructure in the United States, which starts and stops basically with the cable landing stations in the U.S. Um, I've been told that it's, a, uh, it's a, an ambitious plan, there's no doubt about that, but it's something that's clearly necessary. Um, and I'd also like to point out to uh, one of the data points of the slides that Steve had earlier um, relative to the amount of traffic that's actually flowing over these networks and the justification for this infrastructure and why it needs to be built. One of the data points was that uh, that uh, five exabytes equals every uh, the transcript, written transcript of every word that's ever been spoken. And um, I've heard that there's some people out there that think that I'm responsible for one of those five exabytes. <laughs> so I'm going to try and keep this brief. I'd like to thank Colby Sinusel from Cowan and Associates for providing me once again uh, with his data on the uh, M&A uh, landscape in the United States as it relates to fiber-based transport providers. And I'm going to walk through some slides and focus on network infrastructure, fiber network infrastructure in the U.S. from the M&A perspective. And I'm going to point out that I think that there's a fundamental understanding that there's not enough fiber. It's the opposite of a glut. It's actually a gap. Um, broadband is not ubiquitous. Um, and that assets that are in the ground are given a certain multiple of EBITDA. And it's pretty attractive. Uh, for those that have built the infrastructure and that the M&A landscape in the United States has been pretty active. And essentially what that means and what you're going to see here through this theme of all these slides um, is that the fiber assets are being acquired at a pretty rapid pace and they're being consolidated into just a couple of entities. And this is uh, a pattern for value creation for those entities, um, but it also slows down the growth of new fiber assets to be built um, through taking free cash and dedicating it to debt service as part of these transactions. So the problem is that there isn't enough fiber, so some folks have this thesis that since there isn't enough, buy everything that's out there and then your entity becomes more valuable. And at Allied Fiber, we believe that the solution to the problem of not having enough fiber is to build a lot more fiber and make it neutral and open access, which I'll get into in the second half. So here we see some of the, the strategic deals that were done um, and others, uh, but recently uh, you're looking at the different multiples, um, looking at an average of about 10x uh, of EBITDA. And keep in mind that some of these are um, dark fiber providers that, that lease dark fiber out as a dark fiber asset, and some of them are quote unquote fiber providers, which is a term that's generally used in the industry and a little bit unclear, uh, that are selling lit services over fiber. Uh, but still in all, 
these are all related to fiber. Um, and some of them, like, for example, the, the Freedom uh, cable system, that's a very strategic asset out there in California that links landing stations back in one Wilshire, uh, was acquired by Wilcon. Um, and some of the others that are up here, in any case, you see Zayo's acquisitive and obviously uh, done a pretty good job of buying up a lot of the fiber assets. But again, point is 10x. So now we look at the 2012 uh, landscape, and you see where the numbers fall out there. And again, I, I'm not going to spend too much time on each deal and how much it was worth, but you see where the multiple is. It's attractive. And the point is that there's been a lot of, of M&A, a lot of consolidation. The dark fiber product, even for those entities that are in here that would actually lease or IRU dark fiber, the point is that it's being sort of removed from the market or consolidated into entities that may or may not continue on with the policy of providing dark fiber. So here's one of Colby's slides that I found quite interesting because I didn't, I didn't know that he was putting this together, but um, they're talking about, what Colby was discussing here, who could be next in terms of the, the M&A uh, landscape in the U.S. And you see that you know, some have been openly discussed and others have intentions. And then, then uh, Allied Fiber ends up here on uh, the uh, subscale, not a platform company, which I'm not exactly sure what he meant by platform, but we'll get into what the superstructure of the Allied Fiber system represents. But it's just interesting to find that we're now on this list. I think that has a lot to do with the fact that we've built um, a 528 count corning cable from Miami to Jacksonville. And that's what the specific intention of connecting the landing stations in the southern part of Florida, Boca Raton specifically, to the new Jacksonville cables that are coming up. And that obviously becomes a very attractive asset to certain people. Um, you know, we'll get into some of the other attributes of our design in a moment. But in any case, uh, you see the potential acquirers and you know the prey and the predators, right? Um, again, this isn't so much of a situation of you know uh, what isn't being done. It's what is being done, and it's strictly focused on M and A. And I keep bringing that back because, again, and Stephen mentioned this earlier, Australia is a big country. The United States is a big country. It needs a capital plan, it needs a vision, and the execution on that vision is going to take several years because of the size of the country. You can't just build one little piece and stop. Um, so there's, there's a whole other world beyond just this, which is you've got to build a true platform, and it's going to take some time, it's going to take people that see the vision, that have to be patient with it, but the returns that come after the entire platform is built are, uh, from today's standards, immeasurable. Uh, I think that maybe you could carry the multiple forward, but the basis will be just that much larger. So this, is, this might be a little difficult for some folks to see, um, particularly those out there watching this over the web, uh, but I think Eric said that you can all get the slides afterwards. Um, this is really interesting. Uh, which providers are most likely to be acquired and, and XO tops the list? Uh, I just think that it's interesting that everything's sort of been uh, handicapped here a little bit. Uh, the point is that this is the hit list and it's going to get smaller. And what I was always curious about and have been curious about and continue to ask is, in the past five years, how many companies have been acquired? And in the past five years, how many new companies have been created? The new company list is a lot smaller than this list. And it's kind of getting more and more difficult to create anything of size and scale. Uh, but yet that meets, at the same time, the demands of content providers, as we discussed earlier, relative to CDNs and others, and the increasing incredible need for independent infrastructure for network operators in order to operate and in order to grow. And that really is directly tied to GDP growth, as we talked about earlier, particularly with Cambodia and the slides that were presented before. Uh, I'm not kidding when I, think, when I say that there are parts of the United States that I believe are emerging markets and third world nations. They need investment. And uh, the World Bank and IMF and others think that the United States is rich and we don't need money. We need money and we need to focus on the areas in the country that aren't fed. And by eliminating providers, it takes away the opportunity to address a lot of those markets. And then these were the buyers. So some of them are buyers and sellers, but I think at the end of the day, when you're playing musical chairs and consolidating through M&A, uh, a buyer today becomes a seller tomorrow just because they've increased their scale. And the big fish wait for the little fish to get big enough for them to swallow, basically. It's not kind of a waste of time for a whale to eat a minnow. Um, they try to let the sort of medium-sized fish eat the middle and they eat these medium-sized fish. Um, but, you know, here we have a pretty good list. Uh, and again, I'd like to see the chart of where the new network operators are being incubated. Where's the Petri dish for that? And I sort of view Allied Fiber as a, a Petri dish. 
Uh, it's going to enable a lot of existing network operators to normalize their CapEx and OpEx costs. And it's also going to help a lot of new network operator entrants, not necessarily carrier service providers, maybe content providers, or what have you, to enter uh, the U.S. market uh, because the physical infrastructure is there. It's available. So here we go with, again, the, the pendulum swinging from what we lived through in the past decade, uh, which was the, the, the deep, dark glut, uh, with the belief or myth that there was a glut, to the reality of uh, a gap. And the source of this information comes from Vertical Systems Group. Uh, thank Rosemary Cochran for this. Um, the U.S. is really lagging, um, and the demand really is, is put a strain on what we have. So we're looking at you know over 60% of this is uh, commercial office buildings without fiber. And remember, you have to handicap that 36% where if it's fiber, it could be incumbent telco fiber. It doesn't mean that it's dark fiber available for lease on reasonable rates and terms which I know is a mouthful to say, but I gotta say it every single time we talk about fiber, because if you're not talking about it in that context, then it really doesn't mean that the endpoint is accessible by anybody else other than the one that built the fiber in the first place. Granted, commercial office buildings, when you start talking about tenancy, and even more so cell towers, the tower for wireless backhaul, which is another thing we talked about earlier, it's very challenging and problematic for multiple fiber providers to build the same tower when you're talking about tenancy rates of 2.3, I think, on national average. But if you move back away from that, um, the endpoints need the fiber in order to enable the technology, whether it be Ethernet for IP or LTE for IP or whatever. And the truth is that the vast majority of our endpoints in the United States are not fed by fiber the vast majority of the endpoints in the United States are not fed by fiber, okay? We need to acknowledge that. We need to all come clean and stand up and say, I, okay, it's true. And then we need to figure out what's the plan to get those endpoints fed by fiber economically. So all of this pre presents a tremendous opportunity for Allied Fiber and any other infrastructure provider that wants to follow a similar model Okay, and I refer to this as the way. This isn't because I said so or I think it's so cool or it's all about me. This is what the way is. I've seen this done in other countries successfully and they're solving their problems. Granted, they're smaller countries in some cases. Uh, so they have a less of a capex issue to deal with and shorter time frames, but the issue remains the same. So we have a geographic issue. I think the OECD unfortunately puts the United States somewhere in the maybe high teens or low 20s in terms of broadband speeds and penetrations. I think that's grossly unfair for the United States to be put on a list of countries compared to Belgium and Luxembourg, which are the size of this auditorium here. Uh, the only country that's fairly put on that list ahead of us is Australia from a geographic perspective. And again, you can look at what uh, ASC is doing building fiber over land to get to a Western Australia cable system and all the reasons why they're doing it and why it's gonna work and why it's so great, but what's the challenge? The cost to build across Australia. It's the same challenge that we have in the United States. It's gotta be acknowledged, it's gotta be addressed, there has to be a plan, let's all get on the bus and start going. We have growing capacity constraints, it's crushing the infrastructure. We have carrier controlled conflicts. I used to talk about this stuff, people thought I was crazy, and then now we have what's been going on for years but hit the front page of a lot of major publications is a paid private peering agreement between Netflix and Com Comcast, okay? That's nothing new to me or anybody that knows how that stuff goes on, but that is the truth. There are inherent conflicts. Um, there has to be a neutral provider of infrastructure. And again, I want to segregate uh, consumer and user from everybody else that can do something about it. And the demarcation between those two things is net neutrality. Everybody that can't do something about it is subject to their provider's whims, um, and everybody that can is not. And those that can should do and are. Uh, and then, of course, you have technological design and inefficiencies, age of the cable. Uh, there's certain types of fiber that are aerial, for example, versus underground, and there's a, a preference for multi-terabit core transport networks to be buried versus above ground for a lot of reasons, you know, outages, environmental, sag, sway, whatever. Uh, we touch on all of these topics um, specifically to address the broader, the broader issue. And we don't solve everybody's problems, by the way. Ally Fiber does not build fiber to the home. We do not build fiber to the tower. We do not build laterals other than partnering with some folks to build end cable landing stations other than that and the major carrier hotels and data centers. We don't do it. We let all the regional, metro, and local providers build to us 
They're already experts in their field. They have local knowledge. We do not wish to step into their territory. They come to us. We bring them into the superstructure and get them around. That is a combination of the Allied Fiber superstructure, which are all railroad rights of way, uh, and what we affectionately call the cartoon embedded there within. Um, that is something that I used to draw on napkins late at night <laughs> to people when I was trying to explain what we're doing. And now it's on the back of our business card, and uh, it's our, our sort of main collateral piece. You can see that it starts and stops essentially with the submarine cable landing station, so subsea landing point, uh, part of the reason why we're here today, because it really means a lot to us. There's a combination of long haul and short haul, which is the blue line and the red line. Uh, just think of it as the express lane on the highway and the local lane on the highway. And our short haul fiber has access points in Florida. It's every 5,000 feet. There's a handhole, which is a splice box buried underground. And everything north of Jacksonville um, and through Georgia and north is every 3,000 feet. That is a fundamental strategic difference between what Allied Fiber is doing and every other long haul network that was ever built in the U.S. We're not a carrier. We don't sell lit service. We're in the real estate business. We enable dark fiber. And then the next little image there uh, is the Allied Fiber co-location facility. We provide neutral co-location and interconnection every 60 miles or 100 kilometers along the route. Why? Because that's the distance that light travels in fiber before it needs to be amplified, generally speaking. Depends on the lasers you use and if you want to skip one or two huts. But the fact of the matter is that if you want dark fiber long haul anywhere and you're going to pass 60 miles, you're going to need to amplify that light. And that means that you need a building to put your equipment in. It needs to be secure, it needs to be powered, and you need to have access to the fiber. We provide both. So as Steve mentioned on the panel earlier, one of the two biggest issues to a CDN or, or any other network is the transit costs and the co-location. We address both. We provide fiber. There is no transit cost. We provide the neutral co-location. And we do not charge a month of recurring cross-connect fee in our colo facilities, by the way. What we've built thus far is from Miami up to Jacksonville. Again, specific reference to the submarine cables that land in southern Florida and the new systems that are coming in to the Jacksonville area. We've built with a co-build partner 150 miles of fiber in Georgia between Valdosta and Macon. So our next step is to go from Jacksonville to connect to the cable in Valdosta and then skip up to Macon and go into Atlanta. We have placed six of our co-location facilities, as depicted here by that image, which are approximately 1,200 square feet. And those six facilities are now all in Florida, uh, West Palm Beach, Fort Pierce, Rockledge, New Smyrna Beach, St. Augustine, and Jacksonville. There will be five more facilities in Georgia. And as we go all the way around this entire route, we will have a facility every 60 miles. We will have a handhold approximately every 3,000 feet. It's a giant distribution, physical layer distribution platform. Again, we don't build metro, we don't build regional, we don't build to the tower, but we facilitate the network operators that are out there that need to do those things to connect to us because we do the long piece. We do the piece that none of them can afford to do. We negotiate with the railroads, we sign multi-decade deals, we buy duct where we can get it or we'll build it if we have to to connect some pieces. We place new corning fiber cable in those ducts we build new modular co-location facilities that are neutral, and we place them every 60 miles. That's it. We don't sell lit service. We're an enabler. So Ally Fiber is building the first integrated network neutral co-location and dark fiber business here in the United States. I've seen these things operating in other countries, by the way. So I found out after the fact, and it was good for me. It was very uh, uh, reassuring <laughs> to see how successful that they've been. Um, we offer a combined short haul and long haul direct access for every type of network operator imaginable. Um, this enables distributed cloud computing. People talk about distributing the cloud. If you don't have the physical asset, you cannot distribute anything. All the discussions about the higher layer things are all really nice problems to have. But if the physical layer doesn't exist and it isn't open for use for business, then none of those discussions really can be had. And then, unfortunately, a whole different set of discussions happen when there is only one or maybe two providers and you get into the whole net neutrality and control and what you can see and can't see and who's going to pay for what. Our infrastructure improves latency, quality of service, uh, throughput, and control. I say the word control, I don't know, about 50 times a day because that's what this really all comes down to. It's what defines a carrier. They have control of their underlying network assets. Um, and increasingly, it, it's going to define the CDNs uh, and the other network operators that are non-service providers and whether or not they have control. They have control ultimately not only of the fiber underneath them, but their business. 
And basically, dark fiber infrastructure is the basis of economic development and GDP growth. This is another thing I've been talking about for a long time. The ambassador to Cambodia was here this morning. He said the same thing. So, I agree. So this is what we built in Florida and Georgia. Again, I mentioned this briefly. Um, you can see some of the particulars here. I won't go through all of it. Um, but I think that you all have a general sense of what it is that we're building now. Um, happy to give anybody a tour of any of these facilities. I can tell you personally that West Palm Beach is a nice place to go. And anytime anybody wants to go down there, happy to show you around. Um, we also, by the way, have uh, built a ring with duct in Boca uh, that will connect into several of the major uh, submarine station landing stations down there. And we also go into the Equinix facility, MI3. And, and I stress to everyone, the Allied Fiber Carrier Neutral Co-location Facilities, which are depicted by the blue dots here uh, in Florida and the future dots in Georgia, they are not data centers, okay? They're just really clear. I could spend an hour on the difference between a carrier hotel and a data center, but our facilities are layer one, layer two interconnection facilities. They're not meant for servers. They don't have the power or heat profile, the density profile to house servers. They're modular buildings, granted, and we can add two more buildings on the same concrete pad that we pour for the first, but that's really for meet me room type interconnection. They're not data centers. And on our cartoon, we actually have a little modular container data center that's depicted as being appended to the Allied Fiber system because that's not what we do. There's about 50 vendors of modular containerized data centers out there. I wish them all well, and I give them a home to connect whatever it is that they want to connect into our infrastructure. The, the Equinix facility in Boca, the MI3 facility, is a data center. We have our routes built in and out diversely of that facility. So as and when the whole South American continent wants to be fed by content out of the United States, that's a really good place to put servers and our fiber and the transport mechanism here is a really good way to take control of the transport asset. So here's a little bit of a timeline plus the uh, route configuration. Again, railroad rights of way. Uh, we've secured the rights for everything from Chicago to New York and all the way down. Uh, to Florida. We have duct, we have dirt, we have a master parcel agreement for land, and we're working with the railroads and have been for years on the rights away for the rest of it. And, you know, again, you can see how large that is. It's a lengthy discussion, um, and part of it is an education and awareness process for the entire industry to make them understand, number one, this does not exist. There is no entity, no neutral entity that's responsible for the dark fiber and neutral colo for every other network in the United States. So we realized that was a void, so we stepped into it. Have to be aware of that. And we have to know that it's going to take a long time, and we're educating the masses that, that this is a process for them to get behind us in what we're doing, which, of course, we have a lot of support from the carry community, the service provider community, the network operator community. And we will plan every segment of this system in conjunction with them and their network planning windows, because otherwise it's not going to get done. We've cracked the code on how to build this infrastructure where most people don't want to and most people don't even want to acknowledge the fact that infrastructure in the United States is socialized and subsidized. All roads, okay, the rail, our airlines get bailed out constantly because they can't turn a profit on a country this size. This has to be done in a capitalistic way or else it'll be never get done or somebody else will think the government's going to do it or whatever, which wouldn't be a good idea. And we've cracked the code because we've made it a real estate business. So everybody needs to come to that understanding, and then we can get on to building the rest of the country. And you can see here what our plans are for the years going out to the future. Um, as I said, Jacksonville to Atlanta is our next piece. The duct between New York, Chicago, and Ashburn is largely in place. You know, less than 100 miles left to go. That will probably be the next. There really isn't any duct in eastern Tennessee. It's a new build. It's very expensive. It's going to take a while. But everybody likes our route. It's a backdoor in Ashburn. Um, and then there's a tremendous demand for Chicago, Seattle, and then down to Portland for Hillsborough. Um, so we're going to pinch the middle here. Asia and Europe are coming together up there in the, the north route. And that's probably going to be next year. Thank you. I don't know if we're going to do Q&A now or whatever. I could sit if you want or if there's questions from Twitter or anybody out here. We're good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hunter. Oh, I'm sorry. What was the question? Sure.
Sure, please. Okay, no problem. That's a great question. Uh, The question was about the cost, correct? And Hunter's going to go ahead and address that for the overseas group. Again, I don't want to, I don't want to add another exabyte to the, to the world. Um, that's a really difficult one to answer. So the question comes from Steve and Tom, Intelligent Community Forum. Thank you very much. Um, so there's a lot of different subcomponents to what cost is, but really what it comes down to, and this is the single most important thing that everybody has to understand about the cloud, the cloud's based on dirt. <laughs> it's under the ground, and those are called rights of way. And rights of way are expensive. And then again, sometimes there are people that like to build fiber networks in cities and they want things called concessions. And that's code for free rights of way. If you could find me a matrix that explains what a mile of right of way is by county, by state, municipality, by city, if it's aerial, if it's underground, if it's rail, if it's utility, if it's private, please give me that. Because I'm figuring it out as I go along. I could tell you that certain rights of way cost more than others for a variety of different reasons. Um, where we work within the railroads, it has a certain cost structure that varies from place to place and railroad to railroad, um, but it's safe. And that's why we use the railroad, because it's safe. Because the railroads are very particular about security and who comes on the land and, and anything. Public rights of way or get, get challenging. You, know, you could deal with public rights of way for laterals and small pieces, but you really can't, in my estimation, and I speak for a lot of our very large network operator customers, they don't like the uncertainty of public rights of way where you're going to have a road project or something comes along and says you've got to move this and take it down. You're not taking down a multi-terabit core transport network. You, know, you can't route it somewhere else temporarily and they say, well, I don't care, this is all going to get ripped up because somebody got a, a, a highway contractor or whatever. Um, the aerial rights of way cost less to obtain, and they also cost less to build in, and that's the other component. It isn't just the cost to obtain the right of way, which is the first threshold issue. You can't build in it if you don't have it, but then it's the cost to build in it. And we rail plow duct into the ground, which costs more than just tacking up a cable on poles. But again, for that reason, there's safety, there's security, there's reliability, there's predictability. It's going to cost a little bit more to build this superstructure, but we're building this to last for decades. We actually build multi-duct when we rail plow, so we have essentially, in a technological obsolescence perspective, future-proofed what we're doing. We could place a new cable and roll everybody from the old onto the new. Huge problem out there for folks that have IXE networks that are almost 20 years old now. You know, maybe they could squeeze out some 100 gig channels. 400 gig and terabit, I just don't know how that's going to happen on the glass that they have, and they know it too. Uh, how do you replace that? So again, take. Take metro out of the equation, we don't really do that. Take regional out of the equation, take aerial out of the equation, and start focusing on what it is that we're building. And we have our own unique set of, of costs. That'll all get built in and amortized over time. And our real estate business, which is the monthly recurring revenue that we generate from the colos, the individual cabinets, helps us make a model that makes sense financially for us. We could talk about all these others and, you know, again, dollar amounts are going to vary. They're going to vary based on the cable count. We're building a 528 count cable. A lot of network operators out there that sell that service would think that's a ridiculously large size cable to build. We, we don't need that much fiber. Correct. You don't. But there are a lot of other people that need fiber and you're not building it for them. And we are. So our costs are going to be higher in that sense as well. Uh, and also the neutral colo part of our business. We're very focused on the real estate business. That is our business long term. We're in the neutral colo business. So we spend you know, a good deal of money building our structures to be multi-tenant environments. So a lot of folks don't do that. Metro doesn't do that. Typically, regional networks don't do that either. So um, you know, it's sort of difficult to make an apples to apples comparison. But again, rights of way is where it all starts. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Hunter. Yeah, just as a sidebar, I wanted to let everybody know that we have a very large viewing audience from around the world. There are currently over 30 countries that are connected to and viewing this particular event. So welcome to everybody. Thank you for watching. Our next panel is going to be uh, addressing the growth markets for 2015. Now, Sean Bergen is going to be the moderator for this panel. You, you heard him a little bit earlier. 
and I'm going to introduce the other panelists here. That's going to include Steve Liddell, who you heard a little bit earlier, <laughs> Tom Soja, who's up here. Now, Tom, is, this is his first appearance on stage, so Tom's the Vice President Ocean Specialist, where he oversees corporate development and new project definition and delivery for the company. He has over 25 years' experience in lead and, and has led and undertaken hundreds of market analysis, analysis and feasibility studies for fee, submarine cable and optical networks. And we have Jorge Porto, who's here. Now, Jorge is the Director of Sales for Latin America for TE Subcom. He's originally from Uruguay. In 2004, he joined TE Subcom in the U.S., where he serves as Director of Submarine Cable Maintenance and Director of Project Maintenance. Welcome, everybody. Sean, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, panelists, we, we've, we've had a look at what's happening in the CDN space. Now I'd like to sort of get the crystal ball out and have a look at uh, where we think the action's going to be in 2015 and beyond. And I think we've got a good, a good spread of panelists here to cover a large uh, geography. So I suppose I'd like to start with you, Tom. Tell us about Africa. I mean, what markets uh, should, be watching, should we be watching and why? You're, you're spending a lot of time working in that part of the world these days. Uh, okay, well, thanks, thanks Sean. Um, well, from our perspective, uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting things going on in the continent of, of Africa. Uh, as you know, we've been doing a lot of work with uh, Angola cables, but, uh, but there's also work being done by our teams in uh, Nigeria and Ghana and some of the other, uh, other places throughout the continent. I think from a long-term perspective, having, having worked there uh, on projects for the last 20 years now, uh, you know, with, with some uh, looking back now, you can see kind of distinct periods of time where, uh, um, where the, 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 the emerging markets have come from uh, really a place where the, the world was, uh, the, the, the telecommunications network was fixed line, uh, and, and that's all there was. And, and that's the way we counted traffic, by, by looking at numbers of connections, who's got a phone in, in their home or their, their, their business, and, and there were very few. Uh, over time, over periods of time, that has kind of leapfrogged. And um, during that period of time, when in the rest of the popular markets was going through a, a, a process of irrational exuberance, I would argue that places like Africa and the rest of the emerging uh, markets were going through a place of irrational complacency. Nothing was getting built there. Uh, but, but we've seen that change now in the last 10 years where we've got multiple cables on the east coast of Africa, on the west coast of Africa, and now connecting the, the southern hemisphere. Between, between Africa and Brazil. So a lot of that's been driven by, uh, by you know, what we have in our pockets, our smartphones. Uh, you, you look at how the market has developed there. It's been a combination of, of on-the-ground fiber uh, and, and, and the cellular networks that, that extend that reach to the, to the local uh, person in the street. Um, that's been the, the, the driver of growth. Um, we, we see two, two other uh, drivers besides, um, besides the traditional markets for, for telecom traffic, which is the consumer and businesses, and that is, I, I think somebody touched on it earlier today, uh, I think Steve, uh, either you did or somebody uh, talking about Australia in, in the northwest shelf and, and for the oil and gas industry, we see a tremendous amount of activity not only in Angola, but uh, Nigeria, Ghana, that, that's where we're, we're doing projects that address the specific needs of the oil and gas industry. On top of that, you've got the scientific community that are building more and more networks offshore uh, to, to do things like uh, scientific monitoring of the conditions there. I think that's going to be a growing area uh, in, in the next few years. We've managed to marry a business model between the, the scientific community and the oil and gas community uh, in a project that we've put in in the eastern Mediterranean called Poseidon. Uh, and uh, that's probably one of the first, uh, first projects that, that makes economic sense for uh, scientific monitoring of sea, bo sea bottom conditions with, uh, with traffic for uh, more traditional telecom applications and um, uh, in, in the oil and gas environment. So, so that's, that's where we see the activities 
uh, within Africa these days. And of course, continuing to build out the, the terrestrial infrastructure is tremendously important, not only w within each country, but between the countries also, because we still got this phenomenon um, in the southern hemisphere where traffic is, is, is hubbed in places like Europe for, for Africa and, and in Miami for places like South America. And I think that's going to begin to change as, as it makes sense to uh, be able to route traffic economically and efficiently through some of the cables that are going in today. Are we starting to see, sorry Steve, you're standing on the call there. Thanks. Are we starting, are we starting to see uh, some of the benefits of this leapfrogging of technology that these emerging markets seem to be able to take advantage of. I mean, Australia, America, we've all gone 2G, 3G, LTE. Many of these countries in these emerging markets are simply going 2G, LTE. Oh, oh absolutely. That's, that, that's part of it. And, and uh, you know, that's something that, that you can see happen over time. I mean, maybe I'm telling old stories, but, but uh, some of my colleagues on, on the projects that we've been working on in the last few years don't believe me when I tell them, you know, my first times to, to West Africa to, to, dial, to make an international call. You had to stand in line at an international telecom bureau to make an appointment to go into a booth to, to dial a call back to the States. Uh, that's the way it was. And today we complain when uh, sitting by the pool in... Um, in Lagos that the, my, my email connectivity isn't so good. <laughs> it, it, it's really quite dramatic, the, le the leapfrog effect that, that the technology has had. And that's, that's what gives me optimism for, for uh, you know, the continued growth of our industry. And, and you can see it with the, with the number of projects that have been announced in the last few years, uh, not only announced but actually w with contracts that have been been placed with the suppliers to, to, to build these networks. And, and it's building them in places where A, there's either not enough cables or B, no cables at all. Uh, when, when Hunter talks about a fiber counts of 528 strands of fiber in a cable, my God, in a submarine cable we're talking about eight fibers, well, eight pairs, 16 strands of fiber typically at, at the most, and often it's six or four pairs that, that we're talking about. So, so there's a lot of room for growth in the submarine area. Well, hey, let's let's move to uh, another part of the world and, and have a chat chat about what's happening in LATAM and uh, South, South um, America in particular. There's a lot of talk. Of, uh, obviously, we're talking about Brazil. It's a very um, hot topic at the moment, but it's not only Brazil, is it? Yes, <coughs> thank you, John. Um, well, obviously, when uh, we look at the uh, Latin, Latin America market uh, for submarine cable systems, uh, Brazil is the first opportunity that comes to mind. Brazil being a giant. In South America, with uh, over 200 million people of population, over 100 million uh, internet users, and uh, still growing in, in uh, internet, uh, social media, and other uh, high bandwidth applications over over the net. Uh, basically, uh, we see a lot of potential uh, for growth in that market. And obviously, that, that U.S.-Brazil route has generated a lot, of, a lot of interest in the past few years. Uh, but so far, we have only seen one uh, major project uh, uh, moving forward uh, in that route that is still under construction. But uh, we do see other projects uh, moving forward uh, in the near future. Um, so a lot of interest in Brazil uh, for very obvious reasons. But um, if we look at the um, western side of uh, South America, we see countries like Chile, for example, which is a very solid um, um, economic, uh, 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 basically, uh, country uh, in South America, very stable. Um, and uh, we do see potential in that market as well. But um, there is a challenge uh, to reach uh, um, Chile, which is basically uh, geography. To reach Valparaíso, you need a significant uh, investment uh, in a submarine cable route. Uh, for example, to go from Ecuador to Valparaíso, it's about 4,500 kilometers, roughly. So. Um, the construction or an implementation of a submarine cable system connecting Chile and other countries in the western region of South America will require significant uh, investment 
and strong commitments from, from many operators in that uh, region of South America. On the other hand, we also see the current infrastructure, infrastructure as aging. Um, or most of the cable systems in, in that area uh, were built in the late 90s, early uh, 2000s. Uh, in, in initially designed for 10 gig, and some of them, some of them even 2.5 gig uh, transmission technology, and most of them are reaching their uh, maximum upgrade capability. And uh, when you uh, look at the average uh, implementation time from project conception uh, to uh, ready for service date uh, of about 30, 35, 36 months. Um, I believe that uh, many operators in that uh, region are uh, considering the uh, construction of, uh, of new cable systems. So, Jorge, are you, are you suggesting that obvi obviously Brazil is a hot, a hot spot simply because of the population and, and the economic growth that it's undergoing at the moment, interconnectivity with things like SACs? All of those things, all of those things are, are very nice. But are you suggesting that on the west coast of um, South America, things are probably a little bit more urgent? And given the time it takes to develop a project from start, um, there will probably be severe limitations until something new is built three or four years out. Yes, exactly. Um, as I said, um, most of those systems are reaching their upgrade uh, uh, capacity and. Uh, the problem we see there is that um, there has not been uh, a project that has reached the critical mass to move forward. And um, I think it would uh, require um, a big telecom operator to come in and basically um, work with the uh, local telecom op operators uh, and provide some leadership to push a, a, a big investment like this forward. Um, so uh, there were a number uh, of initiatives, uh, for example, TVI, that, uh, that uh, was uh, intended to link uh, countries in, in, in that region. But uh, unfortunately, um, for, for a number of reasons, uh, these projects have, have not moved forward yet. Steve. Uh Moving over to Asia, what, what markets do you think we should be uh, keeping an eye on um, or, or even markets that are set to explode in that part of the world? Um, well, firstly, if I could make a couple of general comments, actually, I think there's some interesting points raised by the, uh, the other two panellists. I think the, um, there, there are a number of factors which have hindered um, the development of submarine cables in uh, some of the, uh, these, these markets. I mean, the first is actually regulation. In, in many uh, countries, there have been foreign ownership restrictions, um, and you know some of those were just not uh, lifted during the time when there was heavy investment in the dot-com um, area. So I think that's been one inhibitor in the past. The other factor, of course, is bro broadband penetration, and uh, you know, the growth of broadband penetration in some of these emerging markets obviously is now you know, creating much more demand for the uh, the upstream uh, uh, content. And yeah, it's a it's a, it's an interesting comparison. I, a, a few years ago, I actually put uh, put together a, um, a private equity uh, consortium for the buyout of GTS uh, Central Europe, and it was almost uh, a similar situation because GTS had a, uh, a situation where the broadband penetration was growing rapidly, uh, but the bubble hadn't actually reached Eastern Europe. It sort of stopped in Vienna because the, the regulatory environment was just insufficiently developed to allow the, uh, enough transparency for some of these investors. So I think there's um, a couple of factors like that here in, um, uh, sorry, in uh, Asia which are also uh, relevant. And I think uh, fundamentally the um, investors that um, have been, I think the, the word you used was uh, irrational, um, 
Complacency, that's right, Tom, which I, I, I loved. You know, the investors themselves have been very reluctant to, uh, to plow money into the building and they will come um, environment without clarity of the broadband penetration, without clarity of the investment, uh, uh, of the regulatory environment, and also without clarity of the backhaul uh, networks, which we've, uh, we've talked about, because that's obviously, you know, the, uh, the biggest bottleneck. Now, all of those factors inevitably are diminishing um, as, you know, some... As a mentor of mine once said many years ago, as if many years ago, if the customers want it and the regulations, uh, sorry, and the technology is available, the regulators will ultimately uh, permit it. So I think we're beginning to see those kinds of transitions in uh, in Asia. We've already talked a little bit about Cambodia and um, and Thailand and uh, Malaysia. I think Indonesia is a huge opportunity. I've, I've spent quite a bit of time there over the uh, the last few months. The growth in Indonesia, primarily driven by mobile, and the uh, introduction of LTE in uh, Indonesia, is going to create a massive. Uh, demand in uh, in the region, but I'd also like to just point out Australia, and that's a slightly different issue. As I mentioned briefly, it's been a, a limited market opportunity for new entrants looking at a geopolitically stable uh, market point, market entry point for um, for Asia, for the simple reason that there have been structural impediments. There's been a vertically integrated structure. So. Well, well, arguably, we've got a, we've got America, we've got the USA as an emerging market. Now we have Australia as an emerging market as well. It's uh, that's an interesting context. Yes, well, I, I, and you know, Indonesia in particular, 280 million population, 117 million um, percent rather broadband. Um, sorry, 117 percent mobile uh, penetration, and you know that is going to transcend you know the fixed you know PC C market. So I think we're going to see huge, huge growth um, in Indonesia. Okay, well, thank you, Steve. Jeff, do we have any online uh, questions? Actually, we do. We had two of them just popped in here. Let me pull one up here. This comes from Anthony Voscarita, CEO of Djibouti Data Center in Africa. How do you see the impact on cost to be influenced in the next five years by the introduction of new cables, such as Angola Cable System and SACS? Oh, I think I'll hand that one to Tom. If you'd like me to paraphrase the question for you. Or... Yeah, sure. So how do, you, how do you see the impact on costs, overall costs, in the Atlantic being impacted on by the introduction of SACs? Well, I think it's, uh, it's hard to say what the exact impact uh, on costs of, uh, depends what you mean by cost, whether it's cost of transport or the total cost of service delivery. And I think, you know, the SACs cable, you could argue, is still a unique route. So there's not a lot of, of what you would call excess capacity. On, on the other hand, it's got to be competitive with, with the alternatives that are out there, right? And we think that there's a, an argument to be made that, that some of the other, that the SACS cable just by being will attract some of uh, traffic that currently goes through other means, through other, through other routes. Not, be, not just because it's, a, it's the greatest route in the world, but it's, it's, it's a matter of, of, of prudent um, portfolio diversification of your routes as a carrier or a content provider or, 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 or what have you. Uh, the, the traditional customers uh, of all of those other routes will want to seek routes that are different uh, for physical diversity, for maybe for efficiency. There, there are some carriers, some of the mobile carriers in, in, in Eastern Africa today currently route their traffic through South Africa and up the West Coast rather than go north the other way. Uh, others make other choices to go, go that way. So there's you know, different routes available for, for different customer preferences. Do we have any uh, other? I, I have one more here. And this one came in via Twitter from Inga at uh, EasyCom. How do you see the Southeast Asia market development differ from more mature markets like the US and Europe? OK, I'll uh, hand that one over to you, Steve, I think. Um, we've touched on that a little bit uh, in terms of leapfrogging technology and the like. So how, how do you see those markets differ from those in uh, more established parts of the world? I think I've actually covered a couple of these points, but I mean there are three factors. I think there is the uh, progression of the, uh, the, liberalator, uh, the liberalization and the regulatory environment, particularly with regard to tobacco, foreign ownership restrictions, and the availability of uh, finance uh, and the reluctance of finance to invest in the, lo those less transparent markets. So I think that's going to be a big factor. The just sheer numbers of the, um, you know, the um, internet uh, 
penetration, particularly from uh, from mobile users, I think is going to be a, uh, a bigger factor in uh, that development. And also, a lot of these um, routes are going to be um, slightly thinner uh, routes in the sense that the demand is very much growing, uh, but it's emerging. And so what you see across the, you know, the uh, Atlantic is now what about 11 active uh, uh, cable systems. If we're looking at just the ASC cable system, there's going to be one. There's going to be one uh, cable system built at least in the foreseeable future. And there is a limited demand. It's, a, it's that early market entry uh, which we saw effectively across the Pacific. We saw that across the Atlantic, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And I think we're going to see that kind of effect in some of these, uh, these really niche markets. And that's what I think investors are really much more interested in, where you've got these niche routes where you can actually see that there is a foreseeable growth demand without necessarily the price competition that you see from 11 different uh, cable systems. Yes, it's, it's a much easier business model to get your head around and understand in that sense from an investment perspective. Easier and harder in some regards because often it's a new market. True. Okay, uh, Jeff, back to you. Thank you so much and thank you panelists there. It's a great insight into 2015. Now, I want to thank everybody for coming here today. I want to thank all of you folks who, who took your time to, to view the, the sessions remotely. Uh, we appreciate everyone, both local and those that came in remotely. Uh, we had a great discussion today by all the panelists, by all the presenters that came through here. Uh, you've heard quite a lot of interesting topics from around the world, almost literally. I want to thank His Excellency, Cambodian Ambassador Hang, for his keynote and all the speakers that came through today. I want to thank our friends at AP Telecom who've once again been leaders in organizing this event. The video of today's event and all the associated collateral is going to be available at uh, www.stateofsubsea.com, so please go there after the fact. Now these events are meant to be informative and provide an opportunity to meet others in the industry. And the next event will be held at the 1st of October in Southeast Asia, so we look forward to seeing all of you there. Thank you. There is a tour of the gallery if you'd like to here in a few minutes. It'll form in the lobby out here.